In the name of Jesus, amen. If you've been following along in Mark's gospel, you expect that our reading for today will be another healing. Jesus cast out an unclean spirit from a man who attended synagogue and cast out a fever from Simon's mother-in-law. He healed the sick of the city and then went out to Galilee to do that uh, again all over. Each couplet is about healing and wholeness. And just before our reading for today, Jesus cleansed a leper. And so we expect that a paralytic who is carried by his friends will be healed. But Jesus offers a different perspective and takes on a different route. After closely studying the words of Mark chapter 2, verse 1, N.T. Wright suggests it is probable that Jesus was the unlucky householder who had his roof ruined that day. If that's true, I wonder if Jesus felt torn between, you know, frustration and joy. Frustration at the hole in his roof and joy when he saw their faith. Do you call the insurance adjuster when your popularity is such that, you know, people will just rip through the roof to get a front row healing? And how could you be mad at people who exhibit such faith? Mark tells us that it was their faith that propelled them to get their friend to Jesus. Is it possible that Jesus didn't fly off the handle because he was awestruck by their persistent belief in him. Did he throw up his hands and say, you know, what you did to my roof, that was not cool. And I forgive you. Uh, and about your paralysis, let's take care of that. The reputation of Jesus, not to mention his authority and power, which he exhibited toward the paralytic, was incredibly problematic for the scribes present that day. He threatened their prominence among the people. Scribes were the key interpreters of the Torah. Common people looked to them for clarity and guidance on how to best honor God in keeping the commandments. The fact that the scribes were in the audience that day and that they were questioning in their hearts about this matter of forgiveness proves that Jesus was not going to get a fair trial before them. His growing reputation among the crowd and his supernatural powers made them suspicious of him. They were probably sent as secret shoppers, looky-loos, who were supposed to figure out what was so special about the sauce that played into his popularity. It's uncertain why Jesus' message and the word of forgiveness on his lips was so provocative. If Jesus was really forgiving the men for ripping a hole in his roof, then he can hardly be accused of a theological crime. And surely Jesus was not the first person who had stood in for God in forgiving sins. In fact, much of the book of Leviticus is a divine rubric for dealing with transgressions. It offers human solutions to spiritual and temporal trespasses. It spells out which animal sacrifices should be performed by temple priests for various grievances. Family members should redeem the land of their less fortunate brothers. Land debts were to be pardoned during the Jubilee year also. Indentured servants would be able to be released of their duties when the outstanding amounts were cleared. No doubt the scribes taught their own children to say, I'm sorry, and the confession and forgiveness that we do each week is a pattern for extending forgiveness to our family and friends, co-workers and strangers. When Jesus forgave the paralytic that day, he was confirming his authority to do God's will through the power of the Holy Spirit. But why forgiveness in the face of paralysis? What, was it guilt that was keeping him on the mat? When Jesus forgave the paralytic, his words presupposed a link between sin and disease. It's not so much that sin is the cause of disease, but like sin, disease is not attributable to neutral forces. 
Sin and illness are the result of the evil that has taken the whole world captive. Jesus' arrival then and his announcement of God's kingdom spells the end to both of these things. As Mark suggests, when God's kingdom comes near, we will not find God or his representative distant, uncaring, or apathetic. If Jesus is going to hand out the kingdom, he'll be giving away healing, but he'll also add forgiveness. And in this story, we witness a faith that seeks them both and whatever else that Jesus is willing to give. These four men didn't really care about rules, rubrics, or roofs for that matter. What they did care about was gaining access to Jesus. They carried their friend from God knows where, and then when they could not get near Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. As Martin Luther suggested, faith is a busy and active little thing. Believe it or not, some have considered this whole faith thing pretty careless. And true faith can be like that. It is so persistent in its pursuit of Jesus that it will bend even human convention and operate outside of those worldly standards to obtain its great hope. They refused to let a thatched roof be a barrier and a boundary for keeping their friend from the healing power available through Jesus. These four friends who realized that Jesus could do something went to any and every length to obtain help for their friend, and Jesus, in the end, adds salvation too. Who do you most identify with in this story? Like the scribes, are you a present skeptic? There's something about Jesus that sort of intrigues you, but you're not even sure what it really is. Maybe you're a bit resentful of Jesus today. You sense Jesus' authority, but you're frustrated at what seems like his indif indifference toward the continual violence and hatred so evident in our world. You came with one thing in mind, but you got another. You wanted justice, but he granted pardon and reconciliation. You hoped to witness a healing, <laughs> but he offered you forgiveness instead. Maybe you're like the friends who have recognized Jesus' power. You refuse to hang with the crowd, and so you have forfeit a variety of other opportunities available to you on a Sunday morning. You have dug through the roof, and you are enjoying the presence of Jesus today. In some way, that's true for all of us. This story is a picture of prayer motivated by faith. You have come to this place to lay your family members and friends before the feet of Jesus that they might know his salvation and restoration. But what about the paralytic in all of this? Have you noticed him? He's completely passive in all of this. He hasn't even said a word. He was brought to Jesus. He couldn't get there on his own. He was forgiven his sins even before he made a confession. Sure, he got up and walked out in the presence of everyone, but that was only after he was commanded and probably equipped to do so. I think that might be what Mark is trying to teach us in all of this. Jesus has made no attempt to explain himself or to defend his right to forgive. He merely provides a graphic demonstration of his power and his authority in our lives. When the paralytic stands on his own two feet and walks away from the scene, Jesus provides the powerful confirmation that the forgiveness of sins is nothing else but a resurrection to new life in his name. Although you made it to church of your own volition today, it's quite possible that the Holy Spirit was the one who carried you here. And in the confession and forgiveness, your conscience was relieved and sin was divested of its power over you. 
And the word of Jesus over you actually shelters you in his power and authority in your life. Jesus is confronting your every foe, dear friends, even the devil and death itself, so that you will be raised up and walk into newness of life, both now and forevermore. Thanks be to God. Amen.